Buonasera a tutti, benvenuti. Good evening everyone and welcome to EIMA and welcome to this uh, conference uh, which I particularly like. Uh, Dario and I have been in contact uh, since last uh, spring and uh, so we've established a personal uh, contact uh, which has been very fruitful. My, uh, I am an entrepreneur. I started, let me tell you an anecdote. I started traveling in 1989. I was 18. I was much thinner and I had more hair. My father told me, you're done with sec secondary school. Uh, so between the secondary school diploma to university, there was some kind of sabbatical period. So I, uh, uh, so I don't want you to hang uh, around uh, uh, with your friends all the time. So we left together, uh, traveling for two and a half ma uh, months, uh, and it took us uh, uh, all around the, the world. And I discovered a wonderful world, uh, uh, the job market uh, at the time. And I discovered a very open-minded world where there was a lot to discover. Uh, that uh, in that period the Berlin Wall had just uh, uh, disappeared, uh, so the world uh, felt very peaceful. And I never experienced a world of fear uh, in the spy stories, in movies, James Bond, and other uh, movies. Uh, the Cuban crisis used to be seen in American movies. Uh, I did travel a lot. I visited almost all countries in the world. Sometimes I look at the map and I say, well, I miss only five or six, and I've seen everything else. My world has changed as a business person. The world changed after the pandemic, COVID-19. We stopped traveling. I used to spend six months abroad and six months in Italy. I don't have a second home abroad, but I have uh, many companies based abroad. I like to visit new markets. The world has changed with the pandemic, and especially when uh, war uh, started very close to home. There was the Balkan War in the 90s, which seemed to be very far away, uh, only concerning a local conflict, which wasn't too violent. But this war has really struck me. And as an entrepreneur, I finally understand that our world is not so open, is very much conditioned, and I understand that the experience of experts in geopolitics, and that's where when, when we met Beth in, a, in April, was uh, when we met it was a very fruitful meeting, I have to understand, and I'm speaking in my capacity as president of an association of many entrepreneurs that uh, used to be uh, we were used to be like-minded. Uh, we, uh, we met again at one of our meetings in June, and again we're here talking about geopolitics. The world is changing. The world is changing a lot, it's increasingly subdivided into regions, and this is uh, very important for agricultural machinery. Many countries tend to uh, produce their own food and uh, so uh, they produce their own foods uh, in, um, in cooperation with like-minded uh, countries. Uh, the world export of uh, uh, grains and food, there were large producing countries, uh, the United States and Europe and Brazil, uh, Russia, Brazil, Australia. Uh, this scenario is uh, no longer that uh, um, widespread uh, and we're expanding the geographical distribution of our machines. Many countries are in investing uh, on specialized machines that we are experts in as it, it, here in Italy. But this is a very worrying period for people who, like me and uh, other Italian entrepreneurs, have always been convinced we could export everywhere in the world with no problem. But that's no longer the, say, uh, the case. So, end of the anecdote, I'll give the floor uh, to a much better qualified person, Mr. Dario Fabri. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I apologize for the delay. I was uh, uh, on uh, 
a, a train that was late. It was uh, half an hour late. Uh, probably should have been on an earlier train. Anyway, thank you very much for inviting me. Our cooperation started uh, last spring when I discovered a new world, a new world for me. And I'd like to tell you a story, a very short one. We talked about it when we last met. I was convinced that a tractor was a tractor. Uh, uh, and I found out that a tractor is not simply a tractor and I discovered this wonderful trade fair and I hope to be able to visit it tomorrow morning. The tractor is no longer what it used to be. It's got something completely different and I was very struck by that fact and I do hope I can be useful here today. Um, a few weeks ago when talking about this presentation uh, today I was uh uh, led to think that agriculture seems to be an old-fashioned sector. Agriculture, uh, is, does that still exist? Um, agriculture tends to be underestimated and very sadly so. Agriculture determines some of the most important international geopolitical phenomena, much more so than we would uh, believe. Without uh, sometimes uh, uh, we may be misled. Let me give an example. Uh, around the year 2010, uh, Brazil, um, a major um, agricultural country, uh, sporting um, a lot of products, a Latin American giant, 200 million inhabitants, the largest country of the Americas after the United States. Uh, and uh, a physiological rival of the United States being so um, uh, uh, ethnically diversified. It's the only country in, in the on, the on the planet uh, that had uh, immigrants uh, uh, from the United States. People from the US migrated to Brazil in the 1980s, um, in the mean uh, 1800s. So around the year 2010, Brazil seemed to have reached an exceptional economic power. The, the BRICS uh, plus uh, South, South Africa, and so uh, the strategy being hunger zero, farmer zero, as defined by um, Lula, President Lula, is now a reality. But there was something that wasn't clear. Around the year 2010, 2011, this perception started deflating the Brazilians, took to the streets to demonstrate um, protest against what? Um, a correspondent of the, of the Spanish uh, uh, daily, El País, didn't understand, very sarcastically uh, wrote, what, what, what do they want? The tens of millions of Brazilians uh, were taken out uh, of poverty. But what are they looking for now? There was something not clear at the time. And it was that China, uh, an ascending power on the planet number two uh, in the world after the US, China, often using agriculture, uh, which is deemed extremely important, uh, was uh, strategically using it uh, to the detriment of Brazil. Brazil did exist and still exists because they sell agricultural products, the products to China. That's their main job. Um, what products? Soybean, um, but not only, especially soybean. Um, Argentina well been much smaller than Brazil. In 2010, the Chinese economy, after decades of exceptional growth, started slowing down. China started buying less from Brazil, and Brazil got into trouble. Oh, I'm talking about agricultural products only. So, agriculture is not a topic. Uh, per se, but it's a whole world. This is an episode where a uh, major power used the agricultural dependence of a country to its own advantage. Of course, uh, superpowers do use any kind of instrument, uh, including agriculture, which is very um, 
very important for a country. The Chinese economy was decreasing and there was also a strategic objective. Let me explain. Uh, starting in the 80s in Brazil, there has been an exponential growth of the evangelicals. What does that to do with agriculture? and the relationship between China and Brazil. We are awaiting the results of the latest Brazilian census, the evangelicals that are the Brazilian Protestants. Brazil is the largest Catholic country in the world, but by uh, uh, mid-century it will no longer be so. They are evangelicals, the Protestants are counting for about 30%. According to the next census, it should, they should be 40%. Brazilian evangelicals have a U.S. inspiration, affiliations of U.S. Protestant churches that moved to Brazil and then turned into Brazilian. And so this is generating, in a larger section of the Brazilian population, natural sympathy for the United States that never existed before. Uh, Brazil is a physiological antagonist of the United States. Uh, in America, the, Uni uh, the United States people are the gringos, uh, the, the dumb, the, the, f the s uh, stupid, um, arrogant, uh, and uh, willing to impose uh, their will. Uh, of course, uh, this attitude uh, is uh, very much disliked by the U.S. And that uh, uh, was very interesting for China. Brazil was becoming a little bit anti-U.S. Uh, so there was an opportunity to reduce agricultural imports from Brazil. So why not? This is an example of how agriculture uh, plays an important role in uh, global dynamics. Uh, I think uh, agriculture uh, plays an important role, and we all know that, but it's not a side role. It doesn't come in through the back door after a secondary element, after many others, more important, uh, other more important ones. If we look at the relationship between Brazil, China and the United States, agriculture is at the very center of this scenario. I talked about Brazil and China, but there's a relationship between Brazil and Russia, which is very much dependent on agriculture. Of course, there are lots of dimensions to be taken into account by ancient antipathy for the United States since the World War II, there was the United States at the time, there was um, somehow a closeness to Russia, not only anthropological, ideological and anti-US, it was also agricultural. Let me explain. In order for the Brazilian agriculture to work, they needed fertilizers that were produced in Russia. So they need to uh, import these fertilizers. So uh, it's quite important. So Brazil is not going to uh, fall out with Russia. Uh, also, President Bolsonaro, before the uh, war started in Ukraine, uh, he si signed uh, additional contracts uh, to import, uh, no, to export fertilizers to Brazil. This is another important element um, to be taken into account, uh, including my first uh, intervention. I briefly mentioned uh, the Ukrainian conflict, and here agriculture plays a major role not saying that Ukraine, uh, Russia invaded Ukraine uh, for agriculture. Uh, Ukraine doesn't need much uh, in terms of agriculture. Mm. But when the war started, the uh, Chinese got scared because they are the leading um, trade partner, uh, partner of Ukraine. And I'll go back to this. And they are doing that in Africa and in, and in Latin America. They are performing a, a land grabbing operation. They take a huge uh, areas of land to. Uh, take the agricultural product and take it home. So the land grabbing in Ukraine by the Chinese was extremely intensive. The impressive that uh, 
the Russians uh, uh, arrived and destroyed everything. Of course, uh, that, uh, that wasn't something that the Chinese liked uh, very much. They were actually very scared of that. And uh, the only agreement uh, is, that uh, has emerged uh, from this uh, conflict is an agricultural agreement between Russia and Ukraine with a Turkish mediation for the uh, exports of Ukraine wheat uh, through the port of Odessa and this of course uh, affects us from very close uh, the, the, one may say this is far away Brazil China this uh, is something that is very close to us we don't import wheat from Ukraine very little uh, but uh, not a much um, the point is that countries in Northern Africa and Eastern Africa, let's say, like Lebanon, they import 80% of the wheat they import comes from Ukraine. Syria imports 75% of their requirements. If we include Algeria, a very large country, it's over 60%. So, so if the Ukrainian wheat hadn't arrived to these countries, there are no Asian countries that choose rice as a main staple. Uh, well, uh, if hadn't the wheat arrived, they would have gotten into serious trouble. Uh, so that would uh, people would have taken to the streets, uh, protests, demonstrations, migrations, and you name it, uh, that would have uh, inevitably uh, ha had an impact on uh, on us as well. The uh, uh, agreement on wheat exports uh, was used by Russia, and they said uh, we're not going to sign it because it's an attempt at scaring. Uh, uh, Western European countries, if you don't agree on our conditions, so we're not going to sign it, and then you have to deal with migrations and uh, turmoil and demonstrations uh, along your borders. At the center of all that, there was agriculture, the Ukrainian wheat, which is essential, essential to uh, the uh, diet of many important populations, including the Middle East and Northern Africa. So these are just uh, uh, examples, uh, just to give an idea of uh, the extent to which agriculture plays an important role uh, on the global scenario. Of course, uh, it doesn't have the appeal of finance, the soft power of finance. Everyone wants to work uh, in finance, but it's certainly much more important than finance. Well, if I may, I'd, I'd, well, it's been a long time now. But uh, up until uh, the 1980s, uh, we were aware that agriculture were to be preferred to finance. Uh, a very uh, well-known uh, movie, Pretty Woman, uh, with Julia Roberts and Richard Gere, maybe not the best film in the world. Uh, it's a romantic comedy, typical American romantic punk comedy, where uh, Richard Gere has a moment of personal weakness, uh, and he says, uh, that one of the reasons for this crisis is what he was uh, 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 used to work as a broker and he said I don't produce anything I don't manufacture anything I'm not in agriculture now finance uh, has a totally different allure but at the time there were people that uh, uh, blamed themselves uh, for not producing anything working uh, on, in the financial um, sector. I don't know whether you want to say something about this? Thank you very much, Dario, for this interesting scenario. And thank you for providing us uh, with your geopolitical update, which is extremely uh, relevant to uh, what we do here. We're going to talk about agriculture and its future, its immediate future. As I was listening to you, I 
uh, remembered that uh, the European Union committed 50% of its aid budget to agriculture. In fact, uh, agriculture has, was not very appealing because the financial sector was driving, uh, was a driving force that was considered more, more interesting. But if the European Union invests 50% of its resources on agriculture, uh, it's probably because they feel it's a strategic area. And what you said confirms us this point. My question is the following. If it is really so important and it's becoming so strategic again, so this means that investing on agriculture will certainly make a difference. From our observatory, we can see that there are countries that have a totally different pace and there are differences in productive capacity. So can you confirm the idea that the more a country can invest on technology in agriculture, the more a role it will play in the geopolitical scenario? Absolutely, this is the other important scenario when it comes to agriculture. It is not by chance that in my short initial story I um, was uh, uh, actually talking about this. I was uh, personally I convinced that agriculture was not a particularly technological sector. I said a tractor is a tractor is a tractor, and I've been proven to be wrong. It's not a absolutely the case, but quite the opposite. And let me add something to what you said. Today there's a lot of talking about uh, food in, uh, independence, food sovereignty, as somebody called it uh, in the last few ye weeks. and. Uh, at the same time, we keep talking about uh, technological independence uh, in agriculture. Think of countries like China and India have uh, this objective, uh, uh, strategic objective, uh, independence in agriculture. Imagine being able, and of course whether you know it's actually uh, feasible or not, so being able to produce everything at home. Um, and of course I'm talking about technology. Of course in India they do manufacture agricultural machinery, uh, but they're not uh, the same technological standards, uh, so they'll have uh, to, they're certainly aware of that. But this is their strategic target, uh, included in the strategic guidelines of the government, is a country of 1.4 billion inhabitants. It's amazing, such a large population. India uh, is actually aware how important agriculture is. In India, uh, India produces wheat and is now in competition with Russia for the export of wheat uh, to, to China. Uh, well, over the last few months, Russia started massively exporting wheat to China. China is another uh, country with about 1.4 billion inhabitants, so they do need to feed their population. India should keep their wheat for themselves uh, to feed their population. But in order to compete with Russia and bring China closer, they've never been friends. Uh, they've always been enemies, in the Indians and the Chinese. They give up some of their wheat and uh, sell it uh, at uh, an increased price uh, to China. And what do they say? We, the Indians, have um, more technological development than and um, can produce better and more without uh, and, uh, and produce more uh, for exports uh, to China. So let me explain. They use technology in Indian agriculture, which is not uh, um, very advanced for the time being, but it's uh, getting better, and you can confirm it to say we are better than Russian technology, we do better than that, Russia has a larger production than India, but dear Chinese friends, from now on we can offer you something because our technology is growing, we produce more and better. It may sound a very commercial um, line of thinking, but it's actually not the case, because it's in the guidelines of the Indian government. 
which is not uh, the, the last government. It was actually a leading government in the world. So the technological development uh, and food independence, which is a kind of wishful thinking, very few countries are um, independent from a food supply viewpoint. Uh, you, you know, we keep talking about uh, zero hunger. The situation is still um, dramatic and it's always been, but focusing on technological development becomes a way to influence uh, the geopolitical scenario. It uh, can influence other countries. Uh, we are growing uh, from a technological viewpoint. Uh, we're growing more than Russia, say the Indians. Um, and that's uh, intriguing because we can think of the competition between these two countries as something based on weapons, uh, armaments, uh, ballistic missiles, uh, chips and electronics, uh, but uh, agriculture, and this is my last observation, is not the, 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 the last uh, element uh, on, uh, in the list. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure and an honor to listen to you. Um, we do share uh, your view. I'd like to make an additional comment uh, based on our own experience, uh, something related to the ethical nature of uh, technology uh, during a war. This is a very subtle ethical observation. So agriculture serves the world. Agriculture is important to feed people, to help them live on in, uh, in the best possible way. During an emergency, we agriculture should receive more attention, not just from a commercial point of view, selling uh, products to a country. It, it's uh, like it, it's the balance of power for a primary economy. So, uh, so we we need technology there, and it, it, the Italian excellence can, uh, as confirmed all over the world, uh, can do a lot. We uh, this is a very international exhibition because people do need to capture this uh, strength. Uh, we have, but agriculture has to be superior, stronger um, in terms of setting the balance of power because agriculture has to support um, populations uh, in an emergency situation, in difficult, challenging situations. Uh, uh, companies uh, were affected uh, during the pandemic and uh, you know and now during a war um, people uh, have to uh, make uh, commercial decisions as well so the agriculture does play an important role about the uh, future strategy on the markets on the global markets this point is extremely relevant uh, because you say it's not all well, it's not too true, and everybody can see that agriculture feeds people, and that's why the, we call it the primary economy. It's not because it came first and was first developed by human beings and then developed before other sectors. It's a primary sector because it represents the support and the main um, element in, uh, on the economic uh, scenario. And here I'm back to this uh, soft power. Quite frequently, agriculture and the protagonist of agriculture are not able to fully develop that. Let me explain my impression, and I'm being self-critical here, because I feel privileged uh, collaborating with you and I feel uh, committed to the sector and engaged uh, somehow. I think agriculture should sell itself much better. 
Well, of course, there are some limitations, uh, evident limitations. Uh, the young people are looking at other sectors and other industries. Uh, but, uh, well, you said something very important. This is uh, um, agriculture feeds the people. This is a country that, for good or for bad, sometimes. Um, we're a bit naive. Um, it's a, Italy is a country of cooperation. Uh, many um, young people don't really know what cooperation is about. Some of them uh, are convinced that cooperation is the same of volunteering, of voluntary work. But uh, if there is this kind of uh, uh, situation which uh, um, creates puts a distance between the young people and geopolitics. There is uh, this uh, tendency, um, th this uh, 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 propension to cooperation. Um, but if that attitude is present, it's, it means that we can bring it into this sector, which really feeds people all around the world. Of course, that's done for profit. I'm not saying we're here to give away things for free. Uh, humans cannot afford doing so, but that's the practical result. Literally feeding people. But uh, presenting this sector as decisive is fundamental because there are um, upheavals and turmoils, uh, and, uh, but uh, people start to death uh, when agriculture doesn't work. Uh, uh, this is uh, something that calls our attention for our attention. We are cutting at technology, we are decisive for our economy, we play a decisive role to prevent the world from getting even into more trouble. Why not focusing on this sector? Uh, and I'm talking about governments uh, and uh, youth employment. You have the data, but um, young graduates uh, are quite unlikely to say you want to work in, in on a farm, uh, work in agriculture. There's a renewed interest, but quite slow. So there's an increased, uh, we should encourage uh, an increased awareness, raise awareness among the younger generations. And then, of course, the strategic component. I'd like to go back to what I said before. Agriculture, uh, well, uh, human beings are not good 100%, but agriculture has a social meaning as well as a strategic value. Um, superpowers do play on that. It's not just about armaments or ships and so on and so forth. They fight over the land. China is literally buying a large uh, section of uh, Africa. They want minerals and agriculture. In exchange for that, they built uh, infrastructure that used to their own advantage to extract mineral ores or mm, uh, mm, take uh, away uh, raw materials. So we're talking about something really relevant and significant. We can't say it's, uh, it plays a secondary role and you should actually encourage all those who want to mm, and do good or do bad in uh, geopolitics. Uh, geopolitics. There's more. Uh, 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 there are several reasons why we should uh, look at uh, agriculture and focus on agriculture. Thank you very much. Uh, well, we're very proud to say that AMA is an incubator of interest and attraction for uh, the young people. We have uh, AIMA desk and AIMA campus so where we have uh, university lectures, uh, academic lectures uh, where many students uh, attend from eight Italian universities. Today we had a thousand students uh, from uh, agricultural schools uh, coming here so there's a renewed interest uh, from uh, the young people for a world that offers a much more professional mm, 
a kind of employment. Uh, you need to know a lot about the soil, agronomics, uh, electronic, uh, um, engineering, megatronics. Uh, there's a lot of technology now which is uh, very, very attractive uh, for the younger generation. So this is very good news. And so we see a renewed interest. Uh, and we really hope to see that. There are so many additional ideas. Uh, I'd like to f n ask you uh, if you have any questions from the floor uh, so that we can open it to the floor for questions and answers. Well, uh, uh, Simona asked the question I had in mind. Uh, we have the know-how, we have technology, but we don't have uh, a lot of land compared to other countries. Um, I listened to Dario's answer to that question, and uh, I have to say that uh, uh, there are additional challenges for uh, young people on getting closer to agriculture for people who are not born into a, a farming family in agriculture it's not easy to um, to get into uh, agriculture so I like cooperation so how can we solve this problem and make it easier for uh, the young people to work uh, in agriculture we know that uh, the co cooperation world is not economically attractive, uh, so it cannot uh, uh, provide any particularly interesting economic career. So I think we should make agriculture more attractive for the youth. In Italy, we do have serious uh, political issues uh, uh, whereby uh, young people are prevented from uh, entering agriculture. I think uh, we should ask Simona the same question. Are there barriers for the young people to work in agriculture? What are these barriers? You certainly know much more than I do in this uh, area. There are cultural barriers, uh, cultural barriers, of course, uh, uh, it's our education, it's the uh, cultural and educational uh, footprint we're trying to uh, create. Uh, and probably these barriers are quite discouraging uh, for uh, young people. So many of them don't get into agriculture and we'll be very pleased to have the new Minister of Agriculture, Mr. Lolod Brigida, will be with us um, during the EMA uh, trade fair. Uh, so setting agriculture um, at the center of the political scene in this country, structural priorities, this is what we're talking about, including encouraging young people to get into agriculture, because agriculture in the future will be in the hands of young people so we need young farmers so we have cultural barriers on the one hand and political barriers on the other so the politicians don't understand how and when to encourage young people to um, work in agriculture I haven't got much to say this is a very technical question I think your answer is very exhaustive but I can say this is a very um, intriguing question. So people are interested to uh, to know more about agriculture. Io volevo semplicemente salutare. Well, I'd like uh, to uh, say hello to General Manager Simona Rapastella and mention that the generational turnover requires uh, some additional uh, solutions. We have, uh, in fact, we should uh, um, value uh, 
people that work in agriculture uh, give more value to them. Uh, they, um, when thinking about farmers and agriculture, is um, sometimes um, I'm not saying. Um, diminishing the value of what we do, but they're not considered as particularly rewarding. So I'm the secretary of the Association of Young Farmers or Agricultural Entrepreneurs, as we call ourselves. So we feel personally affected by that. And back to the topic of knowledge, with Feder Unacoma we're going to sign a new agreement with the network of agricultural schools and institutions so that young agricultural entrepreneurs can get together to develop a um, future for themselves. Of course, they, they have to feel they belong to this sector. They need to feel ownership of what they do. And there's a lack of services in rural areas. And this is not a secondary issue because if I'm young, I become a farmer, I want to send my kids to school and there are no schools in the area. That's a big problem. So I do agree, agriculture is strategic and it's mentioned in the strategic objectives of a country, then a country must be developed and made to measure for that. Well, I don't know whether you have any more questions. Uh, very briefly, going back uh, to geopolitics, uh, when uh, we discussed uh, about these uh, issues, uh, we talk, uh, remembered the prophecy uh, back uh, 15 years ago. There was a forum of uh, world leaders uh, that imagined the future where the industrialized countries would become increasingly agriculture driven uh, thanks to new technologies and to a renewed interest for agriculture, whereas agricultural countries would become increasingly industrialized, offering low-cost manpower and being in need to improve their economies. So my question is, from your observatory, have you noticed anything in this direction or are we still a long way from that future scenario? This is a very complex question. Honestly, this is a, a very much uh, futuristic in a way. While preparing for this uh, session, we discussed uh, about this. There's been a, a certain debate in this area. Uh, and this wasn't a case up until a few years ago, but saying this is um, actually being achieved uh, wouldn't be true. I think there's a, there's a cultural uh, issue there. Uh, even the expressions used about farmers, you know, um, uh, these are expressions uh, um, implying that uh, uh, agriculture um, is populated by people with very little talent, uh, people that wouldn't have uh, uh, be able to do anything else. Uh, in this country we have uh, a wonderful uh, climate uh, conditions, uh, even though we've had uh, very little rain, but historically um, blessed uh, um, by wonderful weather conditions. Uh, we have advanced, uh, sophisticated agriculture. And there's another point we should uh, uh, take into account. Um, competition is considerably strong in agriculture. There's a lot of competition, as in all sophisticated sectors. Uh, we would tend to uh, think of a passive sector like, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, agricultural enterprises are in competition with one another. 
So there is competition in agriculture. Sometimes, you know, we tend to believe that there's no entrepreneurial spirit in agriculture. We tend to feel that entrepreneurs have to be in, in you know, industrialists or, you know, the tertiary sector or consultants. And agricultural entrepreneurs doesn't sound real. Uh, and that's another cultural legacy that we need to uh, get rid of. Uh, so the happy degrowth idea. Uh, so we, we say if you have no family background, you don't come from a rural, uh, you have no rural background, so you turn to agriculture, it's a retreat, growing crops, giving up competition and the speed of the world, you're scared of the world and then you stack back. That's not true. Agricultural entrepreneurs are not afraid of the world. Quite the, the opposite. They are in competition with other sectors in a very sophisticated and technological way. From this viewpoint, uh, cinema uh, hasn't held. Uh, you, uh, we've seen films uh, featuring farmers, uh, uh, you know, um, semi-illiterate uh, with very poor uh, language. And then you have uh, the younger people who failed in a previous job or lost everything and they retreat to the countryside, they turn to agriculture for personal subsistence and that's it. So uh, going to the cultural barriers which to my mind are the most uh, uh, relevant ones. Uh, so uh, agriculture is not that way. Of course, they are not, not everyone's got the right talent, uh, but agricultural entrepreneurs are sophisticated. They speak languages, they do travel, they do use technology, they do take risks. Imagine agriculture in terms of subsistence. What, what risks are they taking? At least they can feed themselves. But that's really silly. Entrepreneurs in agriculture take risks as a, a, any other entrepreneur, very much so. Uh, so focusing on uh, cultural barriers, I'm not teaching you anything, but I think it's really, really necessary because the appeal of the communication uh, society is everything. If a sector is, doesn't have any appeal because it looks like you know the Stone Age, it takes people away from employment and investments, uh, investments uh, not only by the state or by the country, or but also by other companies that they do so uh, to um, have a return uh, on image. Imagine a large bank uh, which may of course uh, um, play a role or a technological startup but will never have uh, um, a, 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 an impact on their image if they decided to invest in an industrial sector which is fashionable and is very attractive and here the cultural barrier becomes a really severe limitation. Yes, of course we could go on and on for another three or four hours talking with you and telling you more about the features of this exhibition, which is very much communication driven. I'll be back tomorrow morning. Uh, I'll be here visiting, uh, taking a look around. I want to know more and uh, understand what it's all about. What you say is so true, is that all the new people, you know, uh, that are more officially engaged in our sector and that we do invite to join us, uh, they all react like me. They go away seriously impressed because they realized uh, that this market is extremely valuable. It, there's a whole industry at the service of agriculture that they knew nothing about.
I'm always, uh, well, I deal with geopolitics and the strategic value of agriculture and the relationship between powers. But I had my precon cultural preconceived ideas. Uh, you know, agriculture described as something strategic and necessary, that's obvious as it should be, but a, a little bit obsolete old fashioned, but that's not the case. We have invited 31 agri-influencers, uh, young people in their mid-20s, uh, early 30s, from some and from a dozen European countries, that's a Ukrainian uh, to participant too, they'll be here with us and we'll have uh, a meeting with them on Saturday morning to, um, to know more about the world, uh, how to know more about the world without being told that uh, agriculture is for uh, people with no talents. Uh, they're all actually young people, very passionate about their work and doing so uh, using all possible uh, communication tools. Uh, thank you so much, Dario, for joining us today. Thank you.